So our next speaker, we are absolutely thrilled to have him with us in College Station. Uh, you've read his bio. Um, he is the only sports medicine individual to ever win a MacArthur Fellowship. This is one of those awards where they walk in the door in your office and you don't know they're coming and they give you this really, really big check and say, you're doing so great, please go do some more. And uh, it is really is a, a true honor that no one quite knows how anybody's nominated for this. So we're really pleased to have our next speaker with us. Uh, one of the leaders in concussion research, Dr. Kevin Gustowitz from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in uh, College Station, and uh, I want to thank uh, Tim and, and the Huffines Institute for, for, for this honor. So uh, sport concussion, it's uh, all over the news. It's rare to pick up a newspaper, watch ESPN, uh, watch the nightly news in a given week without hearing something about this topic of sport concussion. I've been very fortunate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to be studying this for the past 20 years, and uh, I think we're helping to advance the science uh, on this uh, topic. So uh, the word concuss uh, simply means to, to shake violently. And as you can see here, uh, the, in one plane, the, the head being impacted and the brain uh, shaking violently uh, within the cranial cavity. And uh, when this occurs, um, we um, see uh, about 86 to 100 billion neurons that the human brain, the adult human brain uh, houses. Uh, will do something like this. It distorts uh, upon impact, uh, it stretches, and the axon that sits in the center there can swell. And if it um, swells uh, and is not treated properly, managed properly, uh, it can in fact disintegrate and um, uh, we lose that pathway. Uh, many athletes will say, well, I've got 86 billion of these, uh, plenty more to go around. I'm going to continue to sort of fight through this. Uh, the work that we uh, conduct is, is really around trying to prevent uh, this sort of disintegration of a series of neurons uh, and um, uh, to try to better manage this, uh, this injury. But you can see the axon sort of disintegrating there. About upwards of 4 million sport-related concussions occur annually. Uh, this is an estimate from the CDC. And I'll tell you, and I'm going to uh, talk more about this toward the end of my talk, there are no more concussions occurring on our playing fields today than there was 15 or 20 years ago. Despite the fact that we hear so much about it, and there's this uh, concern, uh, increased concern about this, there are no more concussions occurring today than there was 15 or 20 years ago. The, the, the good news is that we know more about it. The media has done a pretty good job of helping to educate. Uh, there are 50 states that, all 50 states now have a concussion law that emphasizes the importance of education around concussion. Uh, and uh, the diagnosis management of it. So we're showing other showing up more often in emergency departments to be evaluated, which uh, would suggest that there are more occurring, but there in fact are not. This is a topic that's been all over the news, as I've already said. Uh, it actually made this list of the 10 ideas that changed the world in 2012. A friend of mine sent me this, and this was the first uh, uh, idea that uh, changed the world in 20, 2012. And I was like, why is he sending me this? this is about the uh, U.S. drone system, but I had to only flip down to the fourth uh, item, the fourth idea, and it was that uh, this one with football players beware concussions can be deadly. And so just to show you the, the sort of put in perspective, uh, the, the level of which this topic has, has reached. Uh, very common to see headlines, as I've already mentioned, uh, such as these. Uh, note that there are an awful lot of positive things occurring around this topic of sport concussion. Uh, that, that oftentimes don't make headlines because negative uh, headlines sell newspapers. That's sort of the, the industry. And so you'll oftentimes will we'll read these. Everybody has an opinion on this. President Obama weighed in this uh, two days before the Super Bowl uh, last year. And uh, uh, as you can read there, said that if he had uh, sons, that he'd have to think long and hard before allowing them to play football. Uh, Tony Baselli, who played, uh, had a long career with the Jacksonville Jaguars, had an interesting comeback to President Obama saying that he does have two sons, both who have played football, uh, and that he'd have to think long and hard before he'd allow them to, to, to get involved in politics. So that was um, uh, Tony's uh, response to this. Uh, one of the challenges is that we can't see this injury. It's been described as a hidden uh, injury. There are new technologies uh, that are uh, available uh, diffusion tensor imaging, which looks at the uh, white matter tracks and the connectivity of white matter tracks. Uh, uh, this is an evolving uh, modality that we're 
uh, really hoping might be able to help us see this injury uh, on, on imaging. Uh, so to date, it's called a functional, we describe it as a functional injury, one that we have to measure the symptomatology, the uh, cognitive function, the, the, the uh, array of symptoms that uh, accompany this injury, and, uh, and balance, uh, changes with balance, which is an area that we do a lot of work in. Um, the, I hope that these technologies will in some, uh, at some point allow us to look at this and, and to, to use uh, the um, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, and, and susceptibility weighted imaging as a way to to evaluate this. So what is all this news? What is all the, the concern and, and in some cases uh, the paranoia that's been created around this topic mean for uh, this population, these young kids uh, who uh, love to play sport? And um, I have uh, three boys uh, uh, and a daughter. Uh, all three boys have played the sport of football, ice hockey, uh, these contact sports. Uh, soccer, there's even a lot of concern around the sport of soccer today and the, the risks of concussion and the long-term effects with repetitive heading of a soccer ball. Uh, this is why Jason Mihalik, my colleague here, uh, who coaches uh, youth hockey, uh, it's why Jason, uh, much like myself, uh, I coach youth football. Uh, we leave our lab many afternoons and head out to the, the practice fields to try to help uh, in, improve safety in sport and try to help coaches uh, think about how to better uh, teach techniques and, and uh, remove the head, if you will, from the game and minimize the number of head contacts, but keep kids physically active. Why do I think this is so important? Well, if you go back to 1996 when the Surgeon General put out uh, his um, report on physical activity and health, uh, in 1996 we were sort of at the peak of the, um, the, the, the uh, childhood obesity and diabetes epidemic. Uh, where we had seen these staggering numbers. Even these statistics here, taken just from uh, two or three years ago, suggest that we certainly are not, uh, you know, while, while we've seen some improvement, believe it or not, in the last two years, uh, there's still uh, a, a lot of concern about uh, the, the inactivity of, of kids. This report, which really pushed the, uh, to sort of uh, put kids more, uh, you know, putting them into to physical activity, to increasing recreational uh, opportunities for kids and organized sport, uh, one of the concerns with this uh, was the increased risk for injury and how do we manage that injury risk to try to keep kids physically active uh, and, and promoting physical activity while keeping in check uh, this and balance this risk of injury. And so this is one of the uh, areas that our center at UNC has really focused on, uh, not just looking at in, uh, managing concussion, preventing concussion, but also looking at musculoskeletal injury. We have colleagues that are working in this area as well. This is a, a piece that uh, Steve Marshall and I uh, published uh, back in 2003, where the sort of take home message highlighted here in red was, was really that uh, the athletic training, sports medicine uh, community uh, really needed to, to shoulder the burden of, of trying to uh, increase physical activity and uh, really focused more on the prevention side of the concussion equation. And um, for, for many years, we've been focusing on developing tools to assess concussion, and we've validated them, put in the hands of clinicians. But there's been little done uh, in the area of, of prevention on the left side of the concussion equation. So that's what I want to sort of talk about. I want to just say why I think this is so important that we not just pull kids from physical activity and uh, we're going to see those numbers climbing again. But uh, I love this quote from Kent Farley uh, from the U.S. Sports Academy that really talks about sport being so important for teaching uh, the, the sort of values of practice and uh, personal development and uh, how we, through sport, we learn how important practice is and how we can, um, uh, you know, work on correcting errors and uh, probably no better depiction of this than this. I love this uh, picture of, uh, of a youth hockey player, you know, fall, get up, fall, get up, fall, get up, and uh, learning how to, to recover from our mistakes. Um, I want to just say that I'm, I'm, uh, I am concerned about concussion, so I don't want to make it sound like we have to go, go, go and just keep kids in this activity. It's about prevention. Uh, our group published uh, two very important papers back in 2005 and 2007 that looked at the increased risk of um, depression in former NFL players once they had sustained three or more concussions during their playing career. And uh, likewise, the increased risk of developing mild cognitive impairment uh, uh, at a relatively younger age, uh, average age of 55, in former players with a history of three or more concussions in their playing career, professional playing career. And so 
uh, we, we really have looked at this and what the long-term uh, concerns uh, are, are with regard to, to sport concussion and repetitive concussion. Um, a, a paper that we have in review right now, though, I think will help uh, to, to advance the science in this area a bit further. Uh, this is looking at functional imaging, uh, not too different from what John had shown uh, earlier. And what we found uh, is that former NFL players, uh, compared to former college players, uh, that it had little to do with the exposure of the added years, eight additional years of, of having played contact sport or football for the NFL uh, cohort. Uh, at age 55, roughly, uh, average age of 55, compared to their college-only uh, comparison group, that it really, where we see this hyperactivity on functional imaging, had to do with those with a history of three or more concussions. Uh, so it had little to do, uh, as you can see, uh, with uh, those that, that played for eight additional uh, years. And so the added exposure, I'm not convinced, is what contributes, and so these subconcussive impacts is what contributes ultimately to these changes. So I'm going to take the last part of my talk here, and I'm going to get up on my soapbox and say a few things uh, that I think are important to recognize on this topic. Look at the number of peer-reviewed publications on this topic just since 2010 relative uh, to the five decades uh, combined uh, you know, leading up to 2010. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of research on this. But what you won't see show, that show up, up in this bar graph here uh, from 2010 on or even 2000 on, there are no studies that really uh, say that there's a specific age by which we should uh, prevent a kid from playing a contact sport. Uh, there's very little there uh, with respect to prospective studies. There's nothing actually with respect to prospective studies on the cause and effect of uh, these neurodegenerative changes such as CTE. There's the, certainly uh, associations that have been identified. We need to do a better job with more longitudinal prospective studies. So some of the areas that we're working on uh, to try to focus on that left-hand side of the concussion uh, equation uh, is to really work on uh, training and skill development, working with uh, coaches, athletes. And I want to emphasize this is not just a football injury. Uh, we see concussions in just about every sport. I often tell people about the cross-country runner that I had in my second year at Carolina. was hit by a deer on the cross-country course and sustained a concussion. The local Elks Club gave him an honorary membership. But um, we, uh, we, we have to recognize that concussions occur in all sports. That was sort of a, a, a rare event. But uh, skill, practice, on-field exposure, teaching kids at the right age how to do this. If we just pull kids for the, and, and put pads on them for the first time at age 16, some people have suggested let's not allow kids to play contact sport until the age of 15. My fear is that if for the first time you put a kid in pads, be, them, be it football, hockey, lacrosse pads, uh, at that age, I fear we're going to see more catastrophic injuries because the kids aren't going to know how to protect themselves. Uh, it's, nor, it's really uh, at, at, at about age 11 to 13, if you get in the motor learning literature, where uh, skill development is a critical window about 10 to 13, critical window for skill development to learn how to uh, protect yourself. So uh, it's about that. It's about changing the culture. We also need to place more emphasis on cervical neck strengthening. Uh, we know, we believe this is one of the reasons why women are more susceptible to concussion uh, than men. Uh, when we compare it in sports where the rules are similar, such as soccer, there is a higher incidence of concussion in uh, women's soccer compared to, to men's soccer. And we think it has to do with, in general, neck musculature. And, um, just to sort of depict this, if you take a blow to the center, to, to the front of the head, in the absence of the neck muscles contracting, uh, that small red dot represents the center of mass of the head, and you have this large acceleration window. If we change this up and allow the neck muscles to contract, as represented here by the yellow line, uh, we shift the center of mass down more toward the, the torso. In doing, in doing this, we increase the effective mass by about 67% uh, of the, uh, the, the um, uh, the, the, the neck and the head, and we reduce or shrink that acceleration window as shown here in the, the dotted uh, line. So we need more emphasis on this, and I think it has more to do with the ability to, to quickly contract the neck musculature than it does uh, global neck strength. And we have a study that just came out about four or five months ago uh, showing, showing this, this finding. Uh, and then finally, putting accelerometers, uh, the, the, the technologies uh, that are out there today are, are far exceed what we had even just five years ago. So we put accelerometers in the helmets of our hockey, youth hockey players and our, our football players. We have small chips, accelerometers we can put behind the, 
the ear to measure the number of impacts, the location of impacts, and the magnitude of those impacts. And we're beginning to teach uh, athletes how to, to, to um, not use their head, how to tackle properly, how not to lead inappropriately with the head. And uh, so we're teaching safer uh, sport uh, from inside the helmet. So to wrap this up, what we think we know, uh, teaching proper technique uh, and fundamentals uh, at the appropriate age uh, will lead to Im improved safety. Uh, athletes are, are safer when coaches, parents, and athletes understand the effect of concussion recognition and response. Uh, unnecessary contact in youth sports uh, should be limited, and I think many of the youth leagues are beginning to do this. Pop Warner football, USA football have limits on the, the number of hours of contact per week, but they're still allowing those techniques to be taught, and so there is still tackling and blocking, and in uh, youth hockey, uh, teaching how to check pro appropriately is really important if we're going to try to uh, teach the kids how to prevent uh, the, these injuries later on. And what we don't know, uh, concussion thresholds uh, and why they vary from person to person. I tell people that concussions are like snowflakes. Uh, there are no two alike, and it's really difficult to say that uh, an impact of uh, 100 Gs is what's going to cause a concussion, because it might be 100 Gs for one person, and it might be 65 Gs for the next person. So we're still trying to advance this, the science around this. As I've already said, uh, if playing contact sports for any number of years, uh, we don't know how many years or how many impacts or how many concussions leads to CTE. We need more evidence to, to, to better answer this question. Uh, and a specific age at which kids are safer to begin playing, as I've already said, uh, needs to, to still be further studied. Uh, great study uh, published a few years ago that talked about whether or not the, the, the uh, pendulum has swung too far. And I love this, this line uh, that, that uh, Dr. Duhane talks about. She says that they, parents and kids get terrified over the diagnosis of a simple concussion, that historically most kids with concussions do fine. Um, and then she goes on to say that our species wouldn't have survived if we didn't. And so there's been a bit of sort of the topic's been sensationalized in many ways. The pendulum has perhaps swung too far uh, in the direction of concussion phobia and uh, that we need to think about labeling this as a spectrum. Concussion is not just a single entity and we should think about it uh, as a spectrum uh, and not such, something such as it's diabetes, you have it or you don't. Uh, this is a, along a spectrum. Uh, so. This is our situation room. We don't uh, help the, the, the US government and the military uh, better understand who has drones out there, but we do. We have a situation room in our lab right here where we're constantly breaking down film, trying to identify better ways to keep kids um, uh, safe on the field. So uh, back to the, t the in conclusion, the you know, legitimate concern versus paranoia, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that uh, we need to find ways to make sports safer. We do this by identifying predispositions uh, to sport injuries and chronic neurological impairment. We need to teach kids how to modify their behavior, and there are great uh, opportunities to do this through advanced technologies, which is why I think innovative science uh, can, in fact, uh, be a game changer in this topic. And I have to credit uh, my team. We have an amazing team in, in Chapel Hill, and if you're ever uh, in the neighborhood, please stop by to visit us. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. We've got a couple of questions here for you. Um, one from uh, uh, Ye at uh, University of Maryland. I have two kids, one playing football and the other playing soccer. The protective gear they wear does not seem to be helpful despite a lot of technical advancements for the last decade. What would you suggest to prevent or reduce the chance of getting concussion in kids? Yeah, great question. So what we know is that uh, there is no concussion-proof helmet. Uh, that if uh, that shaking head that I had shown you, I have another slide I could have shown that actually puts a a helmet on it, and it does show it slowing or mitigating to some extent the, the movement of the brain inside the skull, uh, but it's impossible to totally manage the energy there. So I, while I think those, uh, there are materials out there that are good at helping to prevent skull fractures and these real uh, high velocity impacts that would, would prevent a brain bleed, uh, it's gonna have to be a combination of, of good equipment uh, as, as well as the, these prevention techniques and uh, good coaching and, and technique and rule changes. We change the kickoff rule as an example in the NFL and the NCAA uh, to, to minimize the number of impacts because by moving the kickoff line up five yards and we now we reduce concussions by about 50, 40 to 50% uh, with just one rule change. So it's gonna take rule changes. Um, I have another question here. Uh, is, is it just the concussions that are causing CTE or are there other factors in, in contact sports? And what about people who get concussions in other ways? Can they also get CTE? Yeah. 
So I think the, the evidence on CTE is uh, the, the work that's being done at, at places such as Boston University with Dr. McKee is very, very important. Uh, she did a great job today, I think, of, of uh, elaborating on, on this notion that uh, we don't have good prospective studies. Uh, we do believe that, um, that it's due to trauma, that tau deposition is due to trauma, but what we don't know is what the dose response is. And so uh, there are a number of uh, uh, studies that are showing that uh, military folks, that, you know, that, that are, you know, it's just a simple blast injury, which is different from concussion. Uh, I have a colleague that has uh, Looked, has found this in airplane pilots who uh, vibrations from, you know, that uh, the, after years and years of flying uh, causes similar tau deposits. And so uh, I don't think this is just a sport injury, but it's an easy one to look at given the number of, of head comp contacts, both concussive and subconcussive, that occur in, in sports such as football and hockey. Well, I was going to say, and in, 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 uh, you're pretty on the fence, I was saying the fence, in the middle on some of this, and so I'm going to ask you to go one way or the other. Do you think it's more important um, limiting the number of subconcussive hits or the number of concussions overall? Our research right now in, in the paper that I hope will be published soon suggests that it has more to do with diagnosed concussions, and I believe that. I believe that uh, there, there is a, a neurophysiologically, there is, there's a significant difference between a, a diagnosed concussion with uh, symptomatology uh, that has caused the, the you know, the, the, the injury um, and that, the way it presents. I think that is uh, very different from subconcussive impacts. I, I'm not convinced that uh, a thousand impacts in a year uh, compounded over some period of time is ultimately going to be worse than uh, five diagnosed concussions that we know leads to uh, and, and is associated with uh, depression. Uh, so that's my um, stance today, but again, that's why we do this work. If we knew all the answers, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Kevin, Great. so much. And Thanks. please thank, join me in thanking Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.